So welcome, welcome back everyone. Um, so our first lecturer this afternoon is Stephen Benner. Um, Stephen is kind of one of the world's foremost microbiologists and he's an expert at the question of what is, what is life and what are the signatures of life? He spent a lot of his professional career on that question. And so I think this lecture is gonna be highly useful to you as you guys start thinking about how you're gonna design your Mars mission and how you might detect life using um, the hardware for your Mars mission. Go ahead, Stephen, we'd love to hear what you have to present today. Well, let me do the best I can here. I'm much more used to giving lectures in person so I can look out into the audience of bleary eyed people and see you know, what questions they have. I'm gonna to try to go through three general topics here, not that I will make it to the end in the hour, but how, why life is likely to be found on Mars, how to look for life on Mars and where to look for life on Mars. Let me, let me hit the continue button here so that we understand what's going on. And the short answers to these questions, we, why life is likely to be found on Mars, and I will wrap with this topic, that's because life likely originated on Mars in the same way that it originated on Earth. How to look for life on Mars, I'm gonna spend a lot of time on that. And the answer to that is by looking for a polymer with a repeating backbone charge that is either positive or negative and with size regular building blocks and where to look for life on Mars and water ice. And that's pretty much everywhere, all over the place up near the surface. So let me see what I can do here. So again, you gotta keep in mind that Darwinian evolution is thought to be the only mechanism by which matter can self-organize to give properties that we value in life. And the elements of the sort of the core of molecular Darwinian evolution is to be able to make replication. But replication is not just simple replication. It has to have replication with mistakes. And it's just not just mistakes, it's those mistakes themselves have to be replicable. And that's the only way you can have this feedback of natural selection. Um, and so what we're looking for on Mars when we look for life is for, mar for molecules that support that replication, replication with mistakes, but replication with mistakes that are themselves replicable. So, I mean, my, one of my favorite scenes from Star Trek is when Beverly Crusher is telling the data who's worried about whether he's alive or not. That seems to be a passion of his that the broadest scientific definition might be that life is what enables plants and animals to consume food, derive energy from it, grow, adapt to their surroundings and reproduce. Now that's all wrong, right? Life is a chemical system that has access to Darwinian evolution, period. So data, of course, is smart enough to realize this, that you suggest that anything that exhibits these characters is alive. Crusher in general, yes. And then data says, well, what about fire? It consumes fuel, fuel, it grows, it creates offspring. Right by your definition, it's alive. And then Crusher, who unfortunately is not aware that she has been intellectually bested by a robot, says, "Oh, but fire is a chemical reaction. You could say the same for growing crystals, and indeed you can. Crystals are replicable, right? You can take a crystal, powder it, and seed the growth of new crystals. And you perhaps did this in your high school chemistry class. But obviously, we don't consider them alive. Well, okay, that's sort of Data's question. Why not?" And then data, what about me? I don't grow, I don't not reproduce, yet I'm considered to be a live crusher. That's true, but you are unique. Now, if, if, if the script writers of Star Trek don't understand that they have lost the Aristotelian logical frame by then, right? Replication actually with imperfections is easy. And fire is an example. Um, replications with replicable imperfections, I left the word out, is hard. So fire certainly replicates. But, and each new fire is different. Replication is not perfect. But the problem is that the imperfections are themselves not replicable. That is the grandchild fire does not capture any of the imperfections in the child replicate, which is different from the mommy fire. And so that's also true, by the way, the crystallization. Crystallizations, as pretty as they are, they contain defects. Those defects have information in them, in fact, a crystal of sodium chlorate, which is on the left here, has about as much information in its defects as you have in your human genome. And they even can have features like the brown, uh, the bluer crystals in this case are left-handed crystals, the browner crystals are right-handed crystals. Baby crystals that are seeded from the mommy crystals can retain the handedness. 
but not the defects. That is not the information in that crystal. So that information cannot be transferred from one to another. And that's true also for those nice emerald crystals on the right. Now, you actually do know about a molecule that DNA and RNA are examples that can be replicated. And they can be replicated with mistakes and the mistakes can themselves be replicated. So there's the cartoon structure of DNA. I have pointed out the AT, <coughs> pardon me, COVID, C, G, T, A, and G, C <coughs> base pairs. <coughs> and as you can see, as you learned in your high school biology class, there are Watson Crick pair rules, that is, big things like A and G pairs with small things like T and C. And then there are features, either the triangular features or the Lego structures that let A recognize T and C recognize G. The contact between the base pairs on these two strands is actually as far as possible from the backbone. And that's because the backbone has a repeating negative charge in it. Those are these green P's that indicates a phosphate group, which connects the magenta S's, which is the sugar scaffold on the black bases. And that contact is actually important. Those backbones are repelling each other by Coulombic interactions, minus repels minus. We'll get to more of that in just a second. But the replication is very straightforward. You just separate the strands and then you bring in the pieces, link them together to be complementary to the strand that you have just separated. And if it turns out, if you make a mistake, okay, the mistake will be propagated in the next round. And of course, if the mistake makes you fitter, that is better able to survive, get married, have children, then that mistake will soon dominate the more fit population. And that's what is the elements of Darwinian evolution. And so DNA gives you an RNA, gives you a mechanism for making copies with mistakes where the mistakes can be propagated in the next round. That is. The, the, you can replicate the molecule with errors where the errors are themselves replicable. And that's what gives Darwinian evolution its kick in the life that you know of. Now, by the way, I want to again, go back to note the role of the repeating backbone charges in DNA and RNA. And one of the things I've already mentioned is that it forces the contact between the GC and AT pairings as far as possible from the backbone. Now, you might think it is crazy to entrust your genetic inheritance to a polyanion binding another polyanion, right? Because what you're taught in chemistry is that plus binds to minus. And what you've managed to do is put in repulsive interactions into this system. And uh, there's a couple of reasons why that's useful. I've already mentioned the repulsion forces the G and the C and the A and the T to interact with each other at the tippy tippy edges as far away from possible as the backbone. And that um, repulsion is what it creates the rules A pairs with T and G pairs with C. And one of the ways we know this is because I'm a synthetic biologist, I make alternative forms of DNA or RNA, and I can make alternative forms of DNA and RNA where we keep the A, we keep the T, we keep the C, we keep the G, but we lose the negative charges in the backbone. And guess what? It doesn't do rule-based molecular recognition any longer. That is, if you synthesize alternative forms of DNA or RNA that are charge neutral, the rules disappear. And by the way, if you synthesize alternative uh, forms of DNA and RNA where the backbone charges are positive, they still work. All right, so this idea that this backbone repeating charge is very, very important for the molecular recognition that gives you the rules that allow you to transfer, at least with some fidelity, information from one generation to the next. So how are we doing here? I don't see anybody raising their hands. <clears throat> hmm. Now, it's interesting here. So this repeating charge also lets the sequence of the bases change without causing much change in physical properties. And this is a general rule of chemistry, which is deep and profound. I'm going to spend a minute on it. So the most important thing that you can say about a molecule is whether it is charged or not. If it has a plus charge or a minus charge, it behaves very much different than a molecule that doesn't have a charge, but say has a dipole. That is, a, it has a molecule 
and this is what is actually is being shown in the C double bond O and the N with the red hydrogen attached to it. Those are molecules where the oxygen has a partial negative charge on it. The hydrogen has a partial positive charge on it, but the partial negative charge is equal to the partial positive charge. That is, this is not a monopole. This molecule does not have a charge, but it has a dipole. And my best example of this is you, if you go in and get yourself a bunch of magnets and try to tie them on a string, okay? What will happen is the whole thing collapses as the north poles of the magnets find the south pole of the magnets. And that leads to a folding, actually, that's what, and that fact that what I'm describing here is actually schematically on the left and with atomic detail on the right with the delta minuses and the delta pluses and the red delta pluses and the blue delta minuses is the interaction of dipoles in the protein background because the protein does not have a repeating charge in the backbone. It has a repeating dipole. By the way, that's what causes the protein to fold. Um, but it's more important than that. It also means that once you don't have the most important feature, a charge in the molecule, the molecule will change its physical properties, often dramatically, by changing single building blocks. Now, there are lots of examples of this in proteins. I've just put one of them up. There is something called hemoglobin, which is the protein that is in your blood cells. It's circulating, it carries the oxygen. There's a disease called sickle cell anemia. It comes when the hemoglobin precipitates and it forms these sickle cell uh, red blood cells, which I have down at the bottom right. One lousy amino acid change in that protein out of 500 amino acids roughly causes the protein to precipitate, it changes its physical properties dramatically. And that means among other things, you cannot use proteins as your informational polymer because they would precipitate with many mutations. The last thing you need to do is to have natural selection or that is physical selection, precipitation acting on your informational polymer, right? You want your informational polymer to be just neutral letters, R-E-P-E-A-T-I-N-G, D-I, P-O-L-E, you do not want the letters themselves to be the subject of natural selection. You want the protein to be the subject of natural selection. And so this repeating charge is very important for Darwinian evolution if it's in the informational molecule because it lets that information change, okay? And that's a very important part of Darwinian evolution. Without it, you can't. And by the way, there's also now the role of size regular building blocks. And if you look at the base pairs, you'll notice I have noted that they all have the same size. Um, and by the way, that's important as well as the charge is important. That's important because it allows high replication fidelity. And by the way, we know this again because synthetic biologists, myself included, have synthesized alternative forms of DNA and RNA that have size mixed units size mixed building blocks, some bigger, some smaller, and replication accuracy disappears. And this is actually known long before the structure of DNA was known. There's a man named Erwin Schrodinger, who you will perhaps meet in your future life. He just was a physicist. He came up with something called the Schrodinger equation, and Schrodinger is a, equation is the backbone of quantum mechanics. But by 1943, he was slumming. He decided to become and do some biology. He knew nothing about the structure of DNA, but he knew that simple binding could not guarantee fidelity of information transfer that's needed for biology. For that, Schrodinger needed what he called the physics of phase transitions. Again, back to crystals. If you ever have grown a crystal in the lab or in, in one of these crystal growing kits you can get from Hobby Lobby, you'll see sharp melting for pure crystals and broad lower melting temperatures for impure crystals. Crystallization is a purification phenomenon and that ensures fidelity of replication in DNA. And in order to get the physics of phase transition to let you replicate a molecule like DNA, the exchangeable information must, building blocks must all have the same sizes and shapes. That is, they must all fit into an aperiodic crystal structure. Okay, so those are two things, right? Universal, it has nothing to do with how life emerged on earth or what form you have taken. It is 
fundamental in physics and chemistry, the building blocks of an informational molecule must fit an aperiodic crystal structure. You, that is, you must keep the structure constant as information changes. The backbone needs to have a repeating charge, negative or positive, and that is required to keep the physical properties constant as information changes. And one of the ways we know this is because we have made DNA, RNA alternatives, keeping the backbone charge and size regularity. There's the Lego model for T, A, and C, G. There's a small thing T or C, pairs of the big thing A or G. And then the Lego model, the prongs and the holes are actually hydrogen bond donor and hydrogen bond acceptors. But you don't need to understand any chemistry to understand Lego. You can look at the patterns of prongs and holes, which are not all exploited. We have made a 12 letter DNA alphabet in my very lab by changing around the prongs and the holes on these Lego structures. And so we can actually make a DNA structure with 12 letters not the four that you have in your DNA and RNA. They are forming six base pairs. Those base pairs all have the same size. We, of course, are putting them on a scaffold backbone that has a regular repeating charge. And we can actually get this whole damn system. Oh, by the way, for those of you who are interested in chemistry, there are the molecular structures of what we call an artificially expanded genetic information system, which has the convenient acronym Aegis. And you can see all the structures. Now, I've, instead of having prongs being blue and holes being red, I have used the oxygens, which are hydrogen bond acceptors as red, and the hydrogens, which are hydrogen bond donors as blue. And this is a system that actually fits the Schrodinger aperiodic crystal structure criterion correctly. By the way, you're now looking at double helices of 12 letter DNA, alien DNA, Synthetic, made in the lab. Millie Georgiatis is our crystallographic collaborator up at Indiana University. And each one of those structures actually is two different sequences put on top of each other, showing you how the structure remains the same, just like Schrodinger was talking about with his eight periodic crystals. No matter what the information content is, no matter what the sequence is, this allows the physics of phase transitions to help in faithful replication. This is something that you do not get if you have size irregular building blocks. This is something that does not occur naturally. By the way, this is the sign that Darwinian evolution is operating to maintain that structure. But this is also the structure that is necessary to support Darwinian evolution. And it's not the structure that you and I use. Okay, so this is one of the nice things about synthetic biology, right? I'm telling you what are universal traits of informational molecules necessary to support Darwinian evolution, right? How, how do you know, Stephen? I haven't been to Vulcan. I haven't been to, been to Kronos. I've never met a Klingon. The answer is because we can go into the laboratory and generate alternative structures of DNA, and we can actually get them to evolve. And here is an expanded DNA, Aegis DNA, system evolving to bind to cancer cells and to deliver drugs to them, okay? So we can actually show in the lab because we have control over this system that it does evolve. It does everything that natural DNA does or natural RNA does. And it's a wonderful uh, story to tell, but that's how we know that these two rules are um, operating. So now I'm going to pause and give you a quiz. I would under normal circumstances look for a raise of hands if you want to find life on Mars, what do you look for? Now, I don't know if I should play Jeopardy music right now or uh, what, what, James, I don't know quite what to do, but the bottom line is that since I can't see whether hands are raised and I can't even tell if everybody's gone to sleep, I'll just tell you. We, have, we have one person who's, okay, so we have two now. Okay. Oh, okay. Ask. Three, there we go. Shoot. Well, the, there's the answer to the question. A polyanion or cation that built from size regular building blocks. That's what you look for. Oh, no, sorry. The hands are all going away. So, okay. Give those people, give Peyton an A. I don't know who else had their hands raised. Yes. All right. But that's the answer. Okay. And by the way, this is the kind of structure that does not occur without Darwinian evolution. Right. You can get polymers, which are polycations or polyanions, but they're not going to have size regular building blocks. 
So how do you do that? How do you build an instrument that does that? Well, the answer is, of course, the backbone repeating charge is very, very fortunate because it allows concentration, right? A charged molecule, a molecule with lots of negative charges moves in an electric field. And for those of you who are into molecular biologists, some of you may have actually run electrophoresis experiments with DNA. It's a very common lab way. Uh, to concentrate DNA molecules. Um, and of course, you can also look for size and shape interchangeable units. And of course, for that, we built what we call an agnostic life finder. And the reason why it's agnostic, it's agnostics to the history <coughs> of, the, um, of, the, uh, of the life system. The argument is on Klingon, uh, on, on Kronos with the Klingons or Vulcan with Spock. Everybody will have different structures of DNA. I doubt, by the way, that a Vulcan will be able to mate with a human to produce an offspring, and certainly not one that has um, a romantic inclination for Uhura. But the bottom line is that everywhere in the cosmos where life is found, there will be an informational polymer that has repeating backbone charges and size change, size shape interchangeable units. And that repeating charge allows you to concentrate it. And th this is our so-called agnostic life finder, which has the convenient abbreviation ALF, which is, of course, a inside joke that nobody of the high school age knows about. But there's ALF. Actually, maybe reruns are still on. I don't know if people know about RAL. And you can go back onto our blog, primordialscoop.org. By the way, that is not primordial soup, but rather primordial scoop. And Jan has a nice description of how agnostic life finders search for life on Mars. So if Martian water holds polycharged molecules assembled from units that all have the same size and shape, we have found Martian biology. And this is basically just desalination. I don't know if anybody lives near a desalination plant, but basically I, 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 I've shown here is various a structure. You've got on one side an anode, which has got positive charges on it. The other side is a cathode. Electric field moves charged molecules laterally across membranes that exclude things based on size. So you put your Martian water in the top and you put the charges across it. And of course, if you have DNA, like you have DNA yourself, the DNA will migrate away from the particles into this channel because the holes here are large enough to let them pass. Then the DNA will not get migrated through the next membrane, which is an ultrafiltration membrane, but rather the small anions like chloride and sulfate will move. And then you have a reverse osmosis membrane to keep the charged salts from contacting the anode and fouling them. So the chloride, the small starts, um, uh, so small negatively charged salt components will come out in a stream between the UFM, that is the ultra filtration membrane and the ROM, that is the reverse osmosis membrane. And meanwhile, the polyelectrolytes will be recovered and concentrated between the MEM, the just the size occlusion membrane and then the um, ultrafiltration membrane. Now I gotta keep in mind that Elon Musk will mine tons of water on Mars to make propellant for the return trip. ALF can be sit astride that mining operation. They're gonna be pulling it out of the ground passing it through ALF, if I can get Elon Musk to agree to do this, he's too busy with, busy with Twitter these days, but get him pass it through ALF, and then he can take the water, electrolyze it, and uh, do whatever he wants to do to make propellant for the return trip. But never mind, the electric electrolytes are going to remain because in channels three and five, channel five, of course, reflects the possibility that the polyelectrolyte on Mars does not have a repeating backbone negative charge, but maybe it has a repeating backbone positive charge. And so we have the entire right-hand side of this ALF, the agnostic life finder, moving positively charged things to the cathode, which has a negative charge. And of course, the polyanions indicative, sorry, the polycations indicative of Martian life will remain in channel five. The sodium and other cations will go in the salt to channel six. And of course, water will go to channel seven. By the way, all of this is reusable, right? This generates heat that is used to actually mine, mine Martian water. Um, the electrolytes are also useful in the in situ resource utilization, as they call it. Okay, I see a hand up, go. 
Hello, Issa. Please. Right. So would Alf be like a hundred percent like confirming life on Mars? Okay. All Alf, just- what Alf does is concentrates the polyelectrolyte. Okay. Now you would have to recover the material from channel three and channel uh, five and do a molecular analysis to determine what its building blocks are. And if the building blocks are all sized regular, you found life. Stephen, we have a question from uh, Peyton. They're asking from before, um, why has the 12 letter DNA structure not manifested itself in nature? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, well, the, there's a short answer to this question, which I, I yeah, let me, let, me, let me give you the short answer because I actually have a few slides a couple minutes from that. The short answer to this question is that G, A, C, and T appear to be vestiges of prebiotic chemistry that is chemistry that occurred on life, on uh, occurred before life on Earth emerged, and I'll get to that in a minute to explain some chemistry for that. So the short answer to this question is because the additional eight structures are do not seem to be anywhere near as easily the formation formed by prebiotic reactions. Now the sad part of that is that that's not quite true. There are two additional structures of the eight that we made in the laboratory, which we think actually might have emerged on prebiotic earth. And so the problem is that as you start increasing the number of building blocks, not only do you increase the information density of the molecule, but you also increase the number of mismatches that are possible. And so there is a theory out there which may or may not be confirmed by this that says actually two building block units, that is an AT and a TA pair, are insufficient, they have too low information density, four is needed, six is too much information density because it has too many opportunities for mismatches and therefore doesn't survive without being removed because of a low fidelity of replication. So that's, those, are the, those are the two answers. But let me give you, let me wait for the prebiotic chemistry until the next slide. Are there any other questions? I don't think so. Okay, not at the moment. However, don't hesitate to interrupt. So great. So SpaceX can find life on Mars because synthetic biology defines what alien DNA looks like by making alternative forms of alien DNA. Synthetic biologists understand the universe of possible genetic informational molecules. They must have a repeating backbar charge in your DNA. The backbar charge is negative on the phosphates but repeating positively charged backbones are also possible and synthetic biologists have made some of them. Highly charged molecules are easy to isolate from water. Okay, they move in electric fields, they are captured on charged surfaces. So so this, it's it's fortunate, it didn't have to be this way, but the fact that the repeating backbone charge is universal, fortunately, adventitiously, but nicely, is what is necessary to, uh, it happens to be useful to concentrate. And we do believe that life in the Martian ice will be sparse. And that's because it's also, I mean, because we know how life looks like in Antarctic life, in Antarctic ice, it is also sparse. But we also have some idea of what, how much energy is available in the Martian permafrost to support life. And so you're not going to have dense life. So concentration and capture are very important things. But the agnostic life finder exploits these facts. NASA will not ever build an agnostic life finder. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I hate to be cynical about NASA, but NASA, this has been known to NASA for 20 years. There have been proposals. NASA prefers to fly drones on the surf above Mars. I mean, they're cool, but what NASA has known how to look for life on Mars, where to look for life on Mars, and why it's likely to look for life on Mars for 20 years now, and still has not built one of these things. SpaceX, however, as I have mentioned, will mine volumes of water on to make fuel. Alpha is an inexpensive add-on to its in-situ resource utilization mining of water, which is abundant on Mars and should lo- hold Martian life. By the way, if this amount of permafrost were on Earth, it would be infected by life. I mean, you can't, it's hard for you to go 
anywhere on Earth and not find um, some biology. So looking for Martian life, okay, the answer is how to look for life on Mars by looking for a polymer with a repeating backbone charge and size regular building blocks. This solves all these problems that you have with looking for metabolism or looking for cell structures or looking for other biosignatures. And, you know, rocks, minerals have structures that look like cells. Metabolism is a chemical reaction and many chemical reactions can occur um, without life. Uh, and, but here, what you're doing is you are looking at the molecules that are necessary to support Darwinian evolution, which you believe, or at least theories believes is necessary for life. So where to look for life on Mars now in red, in water ice, which is everywhere near the surface. Now I'm assuming, um, James, that you have arranged other people to talk about Martian geology. So I'm just gonna put one slide up here. There is a map of where Martian ice is. It's everywhere. Keep in mind that polyelectrolytes, polyanions, polycations, these are salts. They work really only in water. They don't work in methane on Titan. They won't work in liquid nitrogen on Triton. They really will work only in water. Mars, however, has abundant near surface water ice. And, and as I've already mentioned, Martian missions will mine it to create propellant for return. Okay, so there you go. But now there's a problem and that's, that NASA has, as I've already mentioned, an institutional cowardice, or you can call it conservatism. NASA, it's an interesting story here, and, and uh, you can read about it on Primordial Scoop. That's not Primordial Soup. .org. And the, so, I mean, basically what happened in 1976 was that Viking landed at two places on Mars. Many of you know this story. They did experiments which were designed by Gil Levin and Norm Horowitz and a few other people to look for the signs of life on Mars by metabolism. Horowitz put radioactive carbon dioxide above the surface and looked for life to fix it on the surface. That's the same thing that would happen out here on the grass. You put radioactive carbon dioxide in the air, the grass will photosynthesize and make sugars out of it. Um, Martian life, they saw it, right? They also looked for the oxygen release from the Martian surface. They watered the Martian surface, just like you would water grass and it would release, it released oxygen. Um, dioxygen was released, which is like we would do on Earth. And of course, Gil Levin, who just passed away about a year ago, he sprinkled radioactive food on the surface of Mars, looking for the evolution of radioactive carbon dioxide, which would what would happen if you um, were fed yourself radioactive food, you would exhale radioactive carbon dioxide. And the reason why the Viking experiment was concluded to have not found life, even though all three life detection experiments detected it, was because a couple of days later, a gas chromatography mass spectrometer experiment was done, which alleged to find no organic molecules on the surface of Mars. And people thought, therefore, that Martian surface was oxidizing, organics could not survive, and they decided that organics were more important, essential to life than metabolism. Now, my, my only contribution to this whole story was about 20 years later, and in 1999, we published a paper showing that the gas chromatography mass spectrometry instrument was incorrectly designed and incorrectly interpreted. That is, they could have been sitting on a pile of organic molecules and Viking and not seen them with that machine. In fact, we told them about benzoic acids as one of the molecules that they could be sitting on. It was likely to have been there because it is the partial oxidative process of organics that fall to Mars by meteorite. It took them 20 years okay, to go look for organics on Mars. A year ago, an instrument was down, broken, so they bothered to look at Mars and organics, and they discovered in Mars benzoic acid. So poor Gil Levin went to his grave wondering why the hell it was that his experiment was called a negative when it was a positive when the gas chromatography mass spectrometry experiment was used to call his positive result a negative result, and Benner in 1999 showed that <laughs> the GCMS was misinterpreted and wouldn't have seen organics even if they had been there in a shitload. And we now know that they are there. 
And the answer is, it is unanswerable. <laughs> okay, that question is unanswerable. Gill tried to go back to Mars with a Martian rocket. It failed on launch. Um, Gill was always treated as sort of a crackpot by the NASA community over the years. It was very unfortunate. Um, but the bottom line is that uh, what happened is that after the GC mass spec result came in, the Mars program was almost instantly shut down. People lost their jobs. They moved on. JPL went on to other things. This is a cultural collapse that people remember, right? And so people are afraid to go back and search for life on Mars, extant life on Mars in particular. So you'll discover that when the Martian meteorite was uh, found to have, quote, cell structures in it in 1996, Bill Clinton allegedly went to Dan Golden, who was the head at NASA at the time, and said, is this life or isn't it? And Golden says, I don't know. And Clinton says, what the hell are we paying for astrobiology? The Institute was founded in response to that, but they still were not going to go search for life. They're going to go search for water. They would search for habitability, everything except going search for life. But, you know, part of the issue is could life have originated on Mars? And the answer is, well, okay, yeah, if it had a similar environment to Earth, and it did, but then the question is how did life originate on Earth? And the answer is we've gotten a couple of statements make, certainly not, by the way, with the three biopolymer system that you have, where you have the informational molecule of DNA being transcribed into RNA, which is used to encode proteins, and that you learned about in your 10th grade biology classes. Um, but rather, there's a hypothesis that DNA evolution, or Darwinian evolution, began with RNA having both information roles and metabolic roles that RNA can catalyze the tempered directed synthesis of RNA with mistakes, where the mistakes themselves can be copied. And by the way, you know that RNA has catalytic potential because on the right hand, that blue and orange structure, that is the ribosome. That's the machine that makes all the proteins in your body. The blue parts are proteins, the orange parts are RNA. And you make your proteins now using the orange RNA in the ribosome and so you are actually a riboorganism. You make all the proteins using RNA catalysis that not only proves that uh, RNA can be a catalyst, but it also indicates that RNA came before proteins in this general natural history of Earth. So that's great. By the way, there is evidence for this. I have a former student of mine. I already mentioned the ribosome. The RNA is the catalyst that makes proteins. It has a few proteins that are slapped on its catalytic core. A former student of mine, Phil Holliger, now in Cambridge, England, has actually made an RNA molecule that will catalyze the template-directed synthesis of RNA with errors, and therefore the errors are then replicable. And of course, you know that RNA is a evolvable system because the coronaviruses that have created so damn much trouble are using RNA as their genome. Okay, so the argument is that there was an RNA world that has an episode of natural history on Earth where RNA was the only encoded component of biological catalysis. It's a one biopolymer life form. And by the way, there are vestiges of it in modern biochemistry. And all these vitamins that you eat, which you may look at the pills, the ones that you were forced to memorize, in biology class and never understood why you were being forced to memorize them. Well, for example, one of them is R niacin. The structure of niacin is shown above the name niacin. That does not work in your body as niacin, but rather it is slapped onto a piece of RNA, which is the orange part of the structure in the lower left-hand corner. And that becomes what's called nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. And it's what does all the oxidation and reduction of things in your body. That RNA part is a handle. The story is it's coming over, left over from the time when RNA is all that we had. This is a hypothesis, which I have just shown you the three old, old, old papers that were developing that hypothesis. But panathenic acid, the same thing that's being used to make carbon-carbon bonds and thiamine, it's the whole story. So these are all vestiges of a time when the RNA world was looking around for cofactors to help it do catalysis. So we can be reasonably confident that an RNA world existed, but the model requires hands-off 
prebiotic chemistry to create RNA for the RNA to be first. For RNA to start Darwinian evolution, it has to be formed in a world that does not have Darwinian evolution. I mean, after you get Darwinian evolution, you can do anything you want, including making a ribosome. And so I've just given you the detailed structure of RNA. There it is. Every bond in red, by the way, is unstable thermodynamically in water. Yet the RNA must work in water. This is one of many paradoxes that are associated with prebiotic chemistry for RNA to emerge on the early Earth. Now, I mean, I'm going to just give you a few of the paradoxes so that you can understand how these are being resolved. One of them is the tar paradox. And you know this. If you take a carbohydrate like ribose, which is the R in RNA, and you heat it up, you get caramel. You can do that in your kitchen. In fact, if you go into the kitchen and put energy into inanimate organic matter, you do not get life. What you do is you get tar if you put too much energy in. That is something more suitable for paving roads like asphalt than life. And Stanley Miller, by the way, the great Stanley Miller, he's the man who started prebiotic chemistry in the 1950s. In 1995, published a paper saying that the instability of ribose and other carbohydrates, okay, precludes them as prebiotic reagents. Ribose and other sugars were not components of the first genetic material. And of course, that's a paradox. If R is not possible, then RNA is not possible. And so that's kind of cute. But you got to keep in mind, our other contribution to this field has been the so-called unified geological model as a way of resolving these paradoxes. So I'm not sure whether you're going to um, uh, um, uh, have another thing on this, but let me just go through it quickly. I, I, so James, do you have another person talking about how Mars was formed? I don't think so. Okay. Here's the story, folks. I'll give you a little bit of background. Earth formed 4.53 billion years ago. How the hell do we know that? Well, the answer is we can look. Uranium has two isotopes that are radioactive, uranium-235, uranium-238. They have lifetimes on the order of a one to two billion years. We look at they, they decay to give lead. You can get solar system objects. You can measure how much uranium there is, how much lead there is. You have two independent systems. And so if the two clocks, uranium lead clocks, one from uranium-235, the other from uranium-238, agree with each other, you got a good date. Okay, now we know that a 10 to the 27th gram body hit the earth about 4.51 billion years ago. That was what formed the moon. Again, we know that because of uranium lead dating of the moon rocks. By about 4.50 billion years, the iron, it's just the dominant metal iron is the most important thing that used to accrete the earth, has sunk to the core. And it's done so taking with it gold, platinum, iridium, in fact, all the metals that love to dissolve in molten iron. And we know about this because whenever you smelt iron from ore that contains gold, the gold ends up in the molten iron, not in the slag. And we know the timing because there's an element called hafnium and there's an element called tungsten. They have isotopes that interconvert. The tungsten sinks with the iron, the hafnium does not. It stays up in the rocky part of the Earth's crust. And we can measure the ratio of isotopes coming from those and we can date therefore the time at which the iron sank very quickly, very, very quickly. But by that means by 4.35 billion years, the mantle has become oxidized Phthalite is iron oxide, iron plus two. Magnetite is iron, Fe3O4, it's more oxidized. That's roughly the same oxidation state as the current mantle of the earth. And that means that carbon is coming out of the earth as carbon dioxide, by the way, not as methane. It's coming, nitrogen is coming out as dinitrogen, not as ammonia, NH3. Sulfur is coming out as sulfur dioxide, not as H2S. And hydrogen is coming out as, as water, not H2. Now, we also know that there's a subsequent delivery of more material. We know that because we can actually find gold and platinum in the crust that was not lost to the core when the iron first sank to the core. And we know it's about 10 to the 26 grams of late veneer from these precious metals came because we can measure them and we know how much each gram of meteorite delivers how much gold and how much platinum. And by the way, we also, I mean, for those of you who are familiar with the dinosaurs going extinct, you know, that meteor 
hit the earth, it delivered iridium, which is one of these metals to the crust. And that's, uh, we know, uh, that's one of these metals that we're using to quantitate the, the, the late veneer. And I don't, I won't go through all the details on this, but there are great pieces of information. We know, for example, zircons trap uranium, zircons are uh, uh, element zirconium silicate. We can get the dates of that zircon quite well. We actually have some zircons have survived from Earth from 4.35 billion years ago. And we can measure the ratio of oxidized cerium, that's four plus, or oxidized cerium three plus. I mean, this is all going back to your 11th grade chemistry course, but we're, we're heavy here. We're drawing on every piece of information you have made ever learned about any element in the periodic table. And that's how we know the redox state of the rocks at 4.35 billion years ago by looking at the redox state of cerium in zircons that survived from that antiquity. And we wrote a paper a couple of years ago, which, you, which is cited at the bottom. It was, when did life likely emerge? We, this is where this is all written through. So we can see this environment today. This is from Iceland. I was just there, basaltic rock. You have electrical discharges. We'd love to say that these could not not have been present. The UV radiation from the sun is not not present. And so the question is, there's your atmosphere. Um, and what happens when you have that atmosphere hit by UV is you get, among other things, one and two carbon carbohydrates. Formaldehyde is one atom of carbon, one atom of oxygen, and two atoms of hydrogen. Glycolaldehyde is two carbons, four hydrogens, and two oxygens. These are simple carbohydrates. And so in the Hadean atmosphere, you did not not have these carbohydrates. And by the way, that is also true for Mars, the same story. In fact, it's even better on Mars because Mars, we can actually find surfaces that are 4.35 billion years old. And we actually have on earth some rocks that have been ejected from those surfaces. You can buy them on eBay and some of them are actually uh, not fraudulent. So cool. So what could not not have happened to these simple carbohydrates, which I've color coded in red, that were not not made in the Hadean Earth, but also Mars, in an atmosphere containing sulfur dioxide, is that they both would react with sulfur dioxide to form these reservoirs of formaldehyde and reservoirs of glycolaldehyde, and these are stable. They rain to the surface on Earth and also on Mars. And as I have at the bottom of the slide pointed out, there's a, um, we actually can estimate how much they have, about 10 milligrams per square meter raining under the surface per year. And that's true on Mars, okay? Because <laughs> Mars at the same time had the atmosphere and all the rest of it was there. So that's kind of cool. So there you go. And by the way, I'm not gonna go into a lot of chemistry here. I can give you 28 slides now of chemistry. These species could not not have undergone maturation. This is, of course, the process that leads to caramelization when you cook sugar. The question is, how do you manage the tar paradox? Well, the answer is, there is the periodic table. I've already mentioned to you the atoms in pink, red, hot red, which are the ones that sank to the core. You'll notice there's iridium, number 77. There's gold, number 79. There's a whole bunch of elements that go into the atmosphere. Those are the light blue ones but there's a whole bunch of ones that remain in the rocks. And those are the ones in orange. And I wanna call your attention to one in particular, which is this element, boron. Now, not many high school courses focus on boron, but boron is really important here because boron just loves to bind to adjacent OH groups on carbon compounds like sugars. So unstable carbohydrates have many of these. I'll highlight them for you in green. There they are, the OH groups on ribose, glyceraldehyde. That's a three carbon sugar. Boron we know is present as borate because we know the redox state of the atmosphere from all that stuff I just told you, including the zircons. And what boron does is it coordinates to those sugars and stabilizes them. No tar. So we know that this has got to have happened on Earth and Mars. The borate also chaperones the carbohydrates during their maturation. It prevents, um, uh, it prevents the formation of tar. And by the way, divine intervention would be required to prevent this from happening. But it's kind of fun. I won't go through a lot of the chemistry here. 
you can solve the tar problem just by doing this. It's observed naturally because among other things, we can actually find ribose in meteorites that hit the earth. Borate stabilized ribose is probably present on Mars today because we have measured borate on Mars. It's there as well as organics and they must have been present on early earth. But of course, RNA ribose is only one building block of RNA. The model that we have is too placid. There's also these impacts that I've already mentioned, which are bringing the gold and platinum as the late veneer. We had 10 to the 26 grams of them. And they are also bringing their own iron core. And here's the important part of this. They've got 10 to the 26 grams of impactors. They are bringing this stuff now in hot red. Okay, and that includes iron and they have a huge iron core. It gets pulverized when it hits the earth. It reacts with oxygen, it reacts with sulfur, it reacts with the atmosphere. And what it does is can reduces those atmospheres. It resets the mantle clocks. It certainly killed any life that was present on the earth already. It has its own iron core that shatters it's insufficient, by the way, to reduce the mantle, but it does reduce the atmosphere to give methane and ammonia, hydrogen cyanide, cyanoacetylene, cyanamide. All of these are not available in the standard atmosphere, but the important point here is that these make the nucleobases, some in quite good yield. Now, this is answering the question that was asked by Peyton uh, a while, I think it was Peyton, a while ago, is why we don't have the basis, right? It's because the bases that were made from that reducing atmosphere are the four standard bases and maybe two more. So cytosine, the C in DNA, RNA, is made by taking those reduced compounds like cyanoacetylene and it makes it, and you know, it makes it in pretty good yield. So this Hadean reduced atmosphere could not not have made adenine, guanine, cytosine, uracil, and a few others. And that's why we say we have the four bases that we have. These are the consequences of a prebiotic chemistry in a post-impact reduced atmosphere in the time. In fact, there's, this is, of course, is very well modeled now. You're looking at, depends on how big the impactor, how long the atmosphere remains reduced. This is Kevin Zonley, just for a very large impactor where the atmosphere remains reduced for say 20 to 30 million years. During that time, you're making lots of hydrogen cyanide. Eventually the hydrogen distills away into, the, into space because it's very, very light and the atmosphere reduces, returns to very oxidizing species. And life has by that point had to have originated. Okay, but the key point here is, um, uh, and I, I won't go through the details, but there's a lot. But the key point here is that you have now a model, okay? for doing this. And I've gotten the left-hand side largely in reds with the yellows being the volcanic sulfur dioxide coming out of the oxidized crust reacting with these red carbohydrates with green borate controlling to make five carbon sugars, including ribose. We've got in the upper right-hand corner, the blue stuff that's being formed, the four bases being formed from the iron reduction in the atmosphere post-impact. I got the purple stuff, which is the um, um, phosphate, which is coming actually out of volcanic or impact glass. The right-hand corner shows you the maturation of these species, how the nucleosides are made in this environment. And the big, the hard part, the formation of oligomeric RNA at the very bottom, polyribonucleic acid, turns out to be catalyzed by the very same basaltic glass that delivers the minerals like borate and the phosphate and all the rest of it. And this just came out. I mean, there you are, you're looking actually at Lisa Biondi who did the experiments. This is, was written up in all the newspapers a couple of weeks ago. You're looking at the formation of RNA on basaltic rock on Hedean earth, as of course is in our laboratory. But of course the point is that that makes all this material, the prebiotic chemistry is very simple. So simple that even a professor can do it. You can make RNA on vitrified basalt glass. We know it made it in the earth because it had certainly had basaltic glass. But guess what the no, number one thing on the surface of Mars is right now? Well, the answer is basalt. It's everywhere. And the only reason why there's less basalt on the surface of Earth is because Earth has plate tectonics, which moves it underground and churns it and eventually get continental crust. Mars has a much more primitive surface. 
And so this chemistry also must have happened on Mars. So we're hoping that will um, uh, encourage NASA to be less conservative. There's something that we think is likely to emerge there, whether it survived there is another question. And I'm going to spare you all the other chemistry that goes into this, but there's the mo molecule that could also happen on Mars. So there you are looking for Martians. Why life is likely to be found on Mars is because Mars life originated, because life likely originated on Mars in the same way that it originated on Earth. And in fact, there are some reasons why Mars would be a better place for life to emerge. How to look for life on Mars. So there's something to look for, NASA. <laughs> or someone call NASA and tell them there's something to look for. How to look for life on Mars by looking for a polymer with repeating backbone charges and size regular building blocks. The charges let you concentrate it, then you have to analyze what you've concentrated to make sure that it fits the Schrodinger equation. Where to look for life on Mars, everywhere. Wow. I'm gonna stop there. If you wanna see more of it, it's on Primordial Scoop where we've written it for the general science interested high school student. Um, I'll be happy to answer any more questions that you have. Thank you so much, Stephen. This was a great lecture. Um, are there any questions for Stephen? We have time for a couple questions. There are any. I mean, I, I would ask uh, Stephen, um, you say that what you could look for life in water ice anywhere near the surface. Is there any is there any like prioritization you would make there? Or is it pretty much uniform across the planet? So like Mars, so so we have been I mean, one of the problems with sample return is you have to find a pick a sample, right? And the other problem with sample return is they're what they're called these privileged regions, special regions, which are more likely to have Mars. And what the, the mission designers do is stay away from those regions, which is kind of stupid if you want to try to find life on Mars. But Mars has global dust storms. This is making lasagna layers with water and then dust and water. It samples the entire surface, at least the accessible surface. And so I don't see any reason to look one place or another. What I do think is important is to understand that the exposure, the, the dust, which is exposed to ultraviolet light, contains a lot of the energy that's going to sustain life in those ice sheets. And so it makes a lot of sense. We know about how much energy there is. There's not a lot compared to Earth, of course, because the sun is much less intense and so on. So what's important in my view is to look at large volumes of ice. And so that's why this uh, institute resource utilization that, that uh, Musk and uh, SpaceX is contemplating is so important. They're gonna get a lot of it. And so you will be able to concentrate poly electrolytes from a large volume into a very small volume and look at it. So I would go anywhere because it's being, that surface is being interrogated by the dust storms and the dust storms are also providing the energy to sustain life. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you so much. This was a fantastic presentation, Stephen. Thank you. My pleasure. And you can go learn more from primordialscoop.org. Yep, and I put the link to that website in the chat as well. Thank you so much, Stephen. Have a My great pleasure. Day. My pleasure. All right, our next speaker now is Ken Brandt. Um, Ken is a NASA Solar System Ambassador. He's part of that program. Um, I'll probably tell you a little bit about that. And he's also a high school teacher. He's the director of a planetarium as well. So uh, Ken, we'd love to hear what you have to present today. Wonderful. I need to, can you hear me okay, first off? Yes, I can hear you can just great. All right. So let me uh, pull up my screen share here. Give me a second to work out the tech. On that, I, there we go. Okay, I cannot share while the other participant oh. sharing. Yeah, let, let me stop uh, Stephen's sharing there. It's, his deck okay. was so good. <laughs> it was really good, and I really liked what he had to say about uh, Levin, because you take one yeah. look at that graph of the day and night, that, the diurnal cycle that seems to be going on in those samples, and you know. Uptake, downtake, you know. So I was I was with him all, all along, and I suspected very, very much that there was something wrong with the chromatograph because there were just too many things that, that didn't add up. And so I'm really glad that our last speaker pulled that down and knocked that thing out. 
because I'm tired of hearing about that stupid chromatograph and why Viking was a bad mission. Viking was bad from the sense of marketing, I think, as well, because it was marketed as an all or nothing life or no life mission. And when everything seemed to come out negative, like Steve said, everything shut down, you know. So a little bit about me, tiny bit. At the end, I'll answer any questions you want to ask about the JPL Solar System Ambassador Program. It's a volunteer program, and you audition, just like most other things, you apply. And if your uh, outreach cred is good enough, you become a Solar System Ambassador. Okay. Now, I just want to show, speaking of street cred, I just want to show the, the Curiosity shirt here. Curiosity is going to be you know, the MSL at this point when I went out to JPL to buy the shirt. They hadn't called it Curiosity yet, so that was pretty cool. Anyway, where do you want to put it? All right, so you're going to design this 30 ton. Uh, James, I got a couple of tactical questions here. Sure, maybe I shouldn't ask. Uh, thing one, does it all have to go in one ship? Um, no, I think Roberts answered that the other day. No, I don't think I, it does. I um, you can kind of. You, Kind of assume that, um, like, essentially the tons would be the crew flight, which right. you could have, you could have launches before and after. Right. Um, so each, you know, if that's what you need to like establish your little base camp. Okay. Um, my email contact information is down here. More than happy to answer any emails if you're thinking about the presentation and you watch the recording later. I say, oh man, we didn't even talk about that. What about this? Please feel free to ask. I love answering questions like this. And I'm pretty um, addicted to my email. So I check it pretty much on my phone. That's the same, you know, I'll look more email. So, you know, whenever you want to email me, go ahead. I run a small rural planetarium in southeastern North Carolina, uh, basically dirt poor county. But we do it anyway, and we do it well. Um, and I'm also a part-time astronomy lecturer for the University of South Carolina Beaufort campus. I teach exclusively online. So all of this is very familiar to me in terms of teaching about um, activities, about landing sites on Mars. Now, this is the traditional educational approach. Okay, I'm gonna show this to you. If you want a primer on how to figure out we're gonna put a robot on Mars, that activity will do it for you, okay? You'll end up, if you do the activity all the way through, you actually end up suggesting a landing site from one of the other three uh, potential landing sites for Perseverance. Um, Everswald Crater, Marth Ballas, I think, and Southeast Sirtis, was that the other one? Um, and then a, a little discussion about the Columbia Hills, but that didn't pan out, we'll talk about why that didn't in a minute. This uh, MEPAG here, Mars Exploration Program Analysis Group, meets periodically in JPL. These are the people, uh, both engineers and scientists, who will be figuring out where to put that first human landing site up on Mars if NASA does it, okay? If it goes by conventional NASA, these will be the guys and gals who figure this out, all right? There'll be extensive meetings, kind of like the ones that went on for Mars 2020 here a couple of years ago. Oh, yeah, right. Exactly. All right. Yeah. So, if you don't mind, my knees are giving me a little bit of a fit today, so I'm going to sit. Uh, if that bothers anybody, please let me know. Um, so, in general, you got three conditions. Number one, your altitude. Now, this is all barring the explosion of some new technology we don't know about yet. Okay. But if you're going to land a heavy NASA on Mars, you want as much of Mars' atmosphere to catch the parachutes or combination of parachutes, whatever friction the heat shield's gonna do for you on the way down, okay? So on this map in the background, by the way, this is a pretty iconic map. Does anybody know who took the pictures and made this map up that we're looking in the background here? I'm just going on me and say it. It's, it won't be that many of you I know this. I know the answer, but I'll see if any of the students do. All right, James, you 10 seconds and then you go, all right? So you kids, you know, students, you got 10. Mm -hmm. All right, James, hit it. It's the Mars Global Surveyors um, Mars Laser Altimeter Instrument. 
Ding, ding, ding. Winner. Yes, the MOLA, Mars Laser Altimeter. Uh, I forget what the O was. Observation? I don't know. Um, Mars Orbiter Laser Altimeter. Okay, thank you. Yes. All right, well, there we go. So that is a relief map. Whenever you see a cool viz like this, your first question has to be, what do the colors mean? Make sure you understand what the colors mean whenever you're seeing this. I suspect, for example, next Tuesday, when we see a web image, that image is going to get massaged so it looks pretty in the visible light spectrum, when in fact, the image was probably taken in the infrared or near infrared, or far infrared. I'm not sure which of the cameras are going to use for that, that first light image, but or combination. They may be using several in tandem. I don't know what they're going to do, but it's going to be pretty splendid, whatever it is. Um, and um, no, I'm not saying anything that our NASA administrator hasn't said, and that is uh, we're looking further back in time. So I would think deep field, some kind of comparison between something Hubble's done. Um, and my private bet is on ABLE, the ABLE galaxy cluster. This Hubble did a very nice job of imaging that, and it would make for a good comparison. Look what Hubble did, here's what Webb can do. You know, so look for an image like that, that compares and contrasts, because they want to talk about why this thing is so advanced, all right? Anyway, you want smooth terrain. You don't want to land in a butt on a rock, a rock, a rock field. You know, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin had to dodge one of those on the way down with Apollo 11 because their computer fell up on the way down because the computer couldn't even run your game of solitaire on your smartphone. <laughs> Forget your smartphone. <laughs> couldn't even do the solitaire thing, you know, and that's the black and white version, you know, the little graphic. Uh, Pixelated K, K for Ks. Anyway, scientifically valuable. Um, you want it. What well, depends on what your mission is going to do. Uh, what do you want the focus of your mission to be? That's going to be on you, from what I understand. So, if your focus is on fossil hunting, then you're going to want to land near certain places. If your focus is on contrasting the geology and the evolution of Mars, that's going to be other places. So, your focus and your mission is going to determine your landing site. For example. Perseverance's landing site is very different from Insight's landing site. Two completely different missions doing two completely different things. Insight, of course. All right, all you guys uh, and gals on the Mars call here, what was Insight designed to measure? Uh, oh my God, this, this is an easy one. This, what was Insight designed to measure? Go ahead, Peyton. Go. Um, it was packed with a lot of seismographs and this mold that was going to dig deep down and um, mm -hmm. look at the composition of Mars's, I guess, insides. It wasn't necessarily the crust, wasn't necessarily the mantle, um, but doing mm -hmm. all that using vibrations. Right. Very good. Peyton well struck. Of course, therefore, we are, we are measuring our earthquakes, or in this case, Mars quakes. Right, or aero crates, aero crates, A E R O, it's the prefix for Mars, of course. Um, and an opinion statement down here uh, seems to be common sentiment, but I actually put it black in color. <laughs> so it's, it's there on my PowerPoint. I don't care. <laughs> I'm getting too old to care about what NASA says about this. That's cute. But, but. All right, for perseverance and ingenuity, as well as for curiosity. The selection process is running down two parallel tracks. Okay, you got one set that's working on landing constraints based on the size of the boulders in the boulder field of the landing site or what surface features are there. Okay, uh, you gotta be able to land safely. Obviously, if you crash your spacecraft on Mars killing your humans, that doesn't look good for anybody, right? So you gotta be safe. Um, safety of site is paramount. That trumps everything else, okay? Um, must be defensible. The AA, there's the associate administrator. In this case, this is the NASA pipeline. It's the same basic concept that any group, public or private, is going to use to figure out where you're going to go, okay, with your people. Um, must be defensible for NASA, of course. Must be done in an open environment. Uh, that site I gave you a couple of pages ago, NEPAG, anybody can go on there. And anybody can attend their meetings virtually. You may not get to uh, chat with the scientists or whatever, but you can certainly attend the meetings. And they're very, very interesting because they talk about a lot of the places you don't hear about in the news about Mars. So um, 
It must be done in an open environment so everybody can see it, because that's how NASA rolls. While there are many possible detriments to NASA, that's one thing they do right. They make sure the information is out there as quickly as they can get it. We're still waiting on ESA's information from their latest probes, because the scientists write the papers first in general, the engineers, and then they and then they release results, which is exactly, well, depends on how you want to do your science. Um, anyway, and of course, China, <laughs> um, like with any information at all, besides whatever looks nice in China. Um, so the acquisition of new orbital data between the first meeting and the fifth meeting, so they're actually winnowing down 64 landing sites uh, used to sound very familiar for those of us NCAA basketball fans until about six years ago when it started adding other teams in, but 64 down to three and then down to one. And that's what happens here. Um, so you get these series of meetings that gradually winnow down landing sites based on uh, go or no-go status and all these different constraints. And the acquisition of new orbital data is always added in by scientists who are taking that data, you know, uh, uh, PIs, the uh, principal investigator of, say, the MOLA mission, maybe, would suggest a landing site based on their data, and they write up a full report and present it. Um, by the way, how do you get new orbital data from Mars, and with what? Another question. Anybody know the answer to that one? How do you get new orbital data? From Mars today? Yeah, so like a lot of this information I've got up here in the first part of this presentation is from 2017. Okay, so given that, um, you know, what what is the current status? You know, what? how do you get more recent information? Drilling and a tumbleweed. And I'm in North Carolina, we don't have tumbleweeds here. So I'm going to keep singing until somebody answers this question. Even if you're wrong, it's okay to answer. Is it something like radio signals? Say again? Is it something like radio signals? Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, data gets sent back in radio packets. But what kind of equipment is sending the data back? What yeah, what, how is the data being acquired is, what the, is yeah. the question. Yeah. Um, would it be satellites? Right, there are satellites orbiting Mars. But what kind of special equipment do they have on them that make the data they send back particularly? Some type, some type of radar. Some type of radar, very good. The ESA, uh, Mars Express, is orbiting. Unfortunately, its Beagle lander failed, but the orbiters have been sending back thrilling data from the same kind of RIMFAX data, the ground penetrating radar that Perseverance has on its aft end is also on Mars Express. And when Dr. Uh, Dr. Kenner, is that his last name? The last speaker? Benner, Benner, yeah. Benner, okay. Sorry, Dr. Benner was talking about all those places in the mid latitudes of Mars where you can find water near the surface, either ice or lake, the custom water, you know, in an aquifer. So, you know, um, Take a Sarah Palin quote way out of context. Drill, baby, drill. <laughs> you get to Mars, you got a lake down there. Tap, tap the groundwater, purify it, try to do all the other things you want to do with water, like um, Mr. Musk wants to make rocket fuel out of it, among other things. So um, any type of life detection equipment that's siphoning water off of that, off of that pipeline coming out of the ground, is not going to damage you. So his ALF, his ALF experiment, for example, you know, might be a very useful thing. So these are the Perseverance final eight, or the elite eight, if you will. Um, Columbia Hills, valuable because right before Spirit kicked the bucket up there, it found evidence of hydrothermal venting and silica laid out by hydrothermal vents. By the way, um, nice, nice. Uh, I love the fact that I listened to uh, the previous speaker because he talked about Opal. And I remember this beautiful image about 15 years ago coming back from, I think, Reconnaissance Orbiter of uh, this beautiful, what looked like an old coastline 
that was entirely made out of opaline silica. Okay, and opal is basically um, not crystallized quartz. So it's quartz that forms in little bubbles instead of little cytohexagons uh, because there's a lot of water trapped in the silica. Um, you know, water affects the crystal structure. And that's also what makes the opal beautiful to look at, how it you know, catches the light all different ways. Um, you know, opal could be a place to not only bring it back to earth, but the impure stuff that you can't sell, you know, then you, um, you look for RNA in there, I guess, and water. And um, you know, Dr. Zilber makes a point in his book, The Case for Mars, which you're supposed to read, uh, about, about the idea of going, making your trip to Mars economically feasible somehow. If you were to land near an opal deposit, you could sell opals that are made on Mars, for, and you can command premium prices. It's very limited supply. If you market them the way De Beers marketed diamonds in the 19th century, you're golden. <laughs> And you're making money hand over fist, along with whatever intellectual problem you want to do. All right, so perseverance and ingenuity, things seem to be winnowing down toward Jezero Crater. Jezero Crater is not a landing site that could have been considered by Curiosity or Opportunity or any other lander, because the landing ellipses for those vehicles are too wide, the extremes. It's very possible if you tried to use Curiosity's landing technology in Jezero Crater, you ended up you would ended up slamming into a crater rim on the way down. So not good. As you'll see, uh, the the, um, the navigation system they're going to use here is really really good. Uh, it's called well we'll talk about it in a minute. Uh, let's see. All right. Yeah. That's great. Okay. If you like looking for fossils, you have probably gone places like this, okay? There's a very famous uh, locality uh, back in the 90s in Florida called the Lysi Shell Pit. And it was a place where a river flowed out into the Tampa Bay over a couple million years and left behind all these river clays and sands. And in those clays and sand, were a great assemblage of Pleistocene mammals and other things that were there about two and a half million years ago. Pleistocene or Pleistocene, one of the two. Anyway, um, you know, right back in the fairly recent fossil past, but still really interesting. Okay, I see a question up here. Um, go ahead. Let's do the question if we can, James, please. Yeah, sure. Uh, the question from Anish is, was the landing site, I think um, they mean for Perseverance, is the landing site already pre-selected or did the rover select the landing site? No, um, now that's that's um, interesting because there is a history of that, that has a heritage. When Viking went into orbit around Mars back in 1976, they did not immediately land. They did some surveys, initial surveying with the cameras aboard Viking to figure out, they had a range of landing sites, but they picked the one they wanted to land on based on the data Viking gave itself. Essentially, I had to go back to California and send it back to the lander part. But if I'm getting this wrong, James, at any point, you know, I mean, I think that's what happened back with Viking. So, no, the rovers did not select the landing site in general. But when we get close to Mars, the rover is very much going to select its exact landing site. You'll see what I'm talking about here in a minute. This is one smart set of machines went to Mars here. This is not a dummy. So you can see all these different geological provinces here that, um, that they really want to dig into. Right now, they are, let's see, is my laser pointer working on here? Or can I actually, um, they're right about here, the delta. I don't, I guess you can't see it, no, but if you see it, okay. Um, the impact crater, if you see the impact crater there, um, look down where the blue meets the gray, in that little uh, inverted uh, sideways C, going like this, a little gulf, if you will, or bay. Um, that's where the rover is now, right up against the delta. So it's running into all these beautiful layered rocks, which is exactly what we were all hoping for. That delta, that is just a gorgeous, you know, it's called the uh, history book. You get about, uh, I'm going to guess around 100 million years of history. This is an educated guess based on how long it takes stuff to layer. 
you know, you're going to have sedimentation rates and stuff like that for delta this size on other planets on Earth. Um, this is some high rise imaging. And high rise is one of the other cameras that really helped inform this decision. As you're looking at a resolution here of about whole plate. Now, somebody would have put a very different um, infrared signature home plate in that picture, you'd just be able to make it out, okay? It wouldn't be easy, but you can see it, right? So the high-rise images were the, were the ones that really helped them figure out where they're going to put this thing on Mars. Okay, so yeah, this is another state. And you can read all that for yourself or read it later. We have, we have stuff to do. All right, but we have other problems, okay? We are not trying to drop a one-ton robot on Mars here, uh, slightly bigger than one-ton uh, robot on Mars. We are trying to drop, what is it, 30 metric tons in some combination, right? Right. Okay, mass, okay, on Mars. Is that the human habitat vehicle? It's got to be that big? It's everything that the human mission would have aboard is 30 tons. Yeah, I would mean, okay, so that. So you can send a greenhouse on a separate flight, right? Yeah, they, like right. Robert said, they can, they for example, they can assume that the Earth return vehicle is already there. Okay, um, good. Yeah, they're just designing the, the the crew the crew flights essentially of thirty metric tons, whatever right. that lands. Okay, so let's uh, look at a couple of videos here real quick. This is the first one. I wanted to talk about. Okay, that may not work very well. Hang on a second. Um, all right. Okay. Now, are you seeing the new new screen? Or are you still seeing my PowerPoint? Yeah, yeah we are. Um, okay, so right now, you're seeing an ad for Chrome, right? Yes. And the sound's coming through okay, too. Okay. Hello and welcome, I'm Sangeeta Tawar and you are listening to One India Podcast. In a recent update from NASA, they have successfully tested its donut-shaped inflatable heat shield technology that works like a parachute and will enable a spacecraft to land safely when it descends through the high temperature atmosphere of the planet such as Mars. Before NASA used its new inflatable technology for slowing spacecraft that are entering the atmosphere of other planets, it will be first need to be packed into the tight confines of a rocket called the Hypersonic Inflatable Aerodynamics Deaccelerator or HIAD. It works like a parachute using the and more software. Right. Oh, that's good. All right, so you get the basic idea, right? Let me stop sharing real quick so I can pull back up the proper screen. Make sure I got the right thing going on here. That is it, okay. Sorry. It's up here. Just have to remember where. There you are. Ah. No. Ah. There. Okay. Now let's watch Mars rover come down on Mars. All right, and to roll over to give the radar a better look at the ground. Okay, in the cage. Shoot the floor. The navigation has confirmed that the parachute. Okay. What does the parachute say? This is not what does the fox say. Ring, ding, 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 ding. No, sorry about that. Um, hey, it's Thursday afternoon. I have off tomorrow, so you know it's like Friday. Okay, calm down. All right. So, what does the parachute say? It is the watchwords of. Oh, I can't remember his name on the set. Elachi. Charles Elachi, who used to be the director of JPL. There are mighty things. Ding, 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 ding. Winner. Okay. You need to email me your address, and I'm going to send you a collector's edition Mars sticker that I've only got like three of still. Okay. All right. So you got to email me your address if that's okay. If you don't want it, that's fine too. I don't, you know, I'm not trying to be anything. But anyway, dear mighty things in uh, binary code up here on the parachute. It has deployed and we're seeing significant deceleration in the velocity. Our current velocity is 480 meters per second at an altitude of about 12 kilometers from the surface of Mars. Here it goes. 
Heat shield set. First advance is now slowed to subsonic speeds and the heat shield has been separated. This allows both the radar and the cameras to get their first look at the surface. Current velocity is 145 meters per second and an altitude of about 10 kilom nine and a half kilometers above the surface. So in the time she took to finish that sentence, it went half a kilometer. You know, yeah, how fast it's moving. <laughs> but you can start to see now the, the detailed structure of the floor of the crater. Now filter converged. Velocity solution, 3.3 meters per second. Altitude, mm -hmm. 7.4 kilometers. Now has radar lock on the ground. Current yes. velocity is about 100 meters per second. 6.6 kilometers of the surface. Starts. Okay. The thing on the right here that you're seeing right next to, if you got the people panel here, that is part of the delta. So the rover is now moving itself in response to its environment. So the question you asked earlier, I don't remember the gentleman who asked the question, but the question about, you know, does the rover land itself from here on out? Oh, yes, it does. <laughs> yep, this is all perseverance right here. Perseverance is continuing to descend on the parachute. We are commenting up on the initialization of terrain relative navigation and subsequently the timing of the landing engines. Our current velocity is about 90 meters per second at an altitude of 4.2 kilometers. Hope you have valid. We have confirmation that the lander vision system has produced a valid solution and part of terrain relative navigation. Ready. We have priming of the landing engines. Back shell set. Current velocity is 83 meters per second at about 2.6 kilometers from the surface of Mars. The Sorry, I don't know what I just did. Excuse me. Let me forward this out. I hit the wrong button. I'm sorry about that. Let me get back to where we were. Okay. So where are we getting all these views from? How, do we, how are we able to see underneath the landing setup on Mars? This has never happened before. Oh, Peyton, go ahead. Well, the Perseverance was built with cameras in its bottom so that um, it could navigate the whole process of landing relative to ground features. Exactly. If you look at the graphics down here at the bottom underneath our video of Mars, um, each of these pieces has a camera. The back shell that's separated has a camera looking down onto the sky crane slash rover slash helicopter and all that other jazz. Okay. The sky crane has a camera that looks down on the rover. The rover has another little camera looking up at the sky crane. And of course, this camera you're seeing right now, looking at the ground. Eight meters per second, altitude about 300 meters off the surface of Mars. We have started our constant velocity accordion, which means we are conducting the sky crane, about to conduct the sky crane maneuver. Sky crane maneuver has started. I love this set of images. About 20 meters off the surface. Yeah. And MRO is the orbiter looking down on this while it's happening. It's really good. Cool. Delta. Touch on confirmed. Perseverance safely on the surface of Mars, ready to begin picking the sands of top flight. Yay. They did good. All right. Then that never gets old for me. I watched it live oh. and I watched it again when all those videos came out. Yeah. I can't it's believe so. that this did not win best documentary short at the Oscars. Honestly, this is literally you know out of this world stuff that they're doing here. Let me get back to the right screen. Sorry about that. We've got this stupid icon up here blocking this window, that window right there. <laughs> okay. So now, here's how it did it. Here's how uh, Perseverance got down safely using its own cameras, its own ground radar, and you know, articulating all that at the same time while it was flying, moving very fast down, down to the surface of Mars. 
It's the little button. It's supposed to happen. Nope. We are in Death Valley testing terrain relative navigation, the new technology for Mars 2020. The terrain in Death Valley is very much like Mars. It has a lot of sand dunes and steep slopes. It's quite similar to the landing site that Mars 2020 will be going to. We're taking a copy of the system that will be on the spacecraft and we're testing it in the way that it would be used during the flight mission. Terrain relative navigation gives the vehicle the ability to figure out where it is. This is kind of along the same lines of what the Apollo astronauts did uh, with people in the loop uh, back in the day. Those guys uh, were looking out the window and uh, looking for different craters and other features on the moon that they knew of from the maps we had of the moon. So that way they could figure out where they are and figure out where they needed to land to, to be safe. So for the first time here on Mars, we, we're, we're automating that. What terrain relative navigation gives you is the ability to avoid hazards that you already know about. So large hazards, hills, craters, things that you've seen before. With the camera, we take images as we're descending and we match pieces of the image to orbital imagery that we have stored on board. And if we make many of these matches, we are able to figure out where we are relative to the map. If we didn't have terrain relative navigation, the probability of landing safely at Jezero Crater is about 80 to 85 percent. But with Mars 2020, we can actually bring that probability of success of landing safely at Jezero Crater all the way up to 99 percent safe every single time. We don't have an astronaut that we can put on board Mars 2020, uh, but we can put this, uh, this system, this terrain relative navigation system, so that the, the spacecraft could figure it out on its own. I could see it being used on lunar missions, science missions, as well as human missions. Future Mars missions, of course, Mars sample return, Europa lander, landing on a comet, um, pretty much everywhere you want to land, you're going to want to have terrain relative navigation. Now, all the video material and stuff I'm using, all the images, are either from past NEPAD workshops or from NASA themselves. Um, like I said, one of the nice things about an open space program is you get access to everything. And obviously, they're wanting to explain, they want to tell their story. Now, a word about science fiction. When I was listening to Dr. Zuber the other night, it's very clear to me that forays into the fantastic are not going to work for you. You want to talk about how you're going to do time travel when you get to Mars, don't do it here. <laughs> okay, that's really cool. Write the book, you know, sell millions of copies, make me look bad, you know, but you know, don't do it here. This is not the time of the place. You're trying to design a habitat and the way to get there with stuff we already have. For example, when you want to start talking about generating oxygen on Mars, one decent way to do it if you upscale it, the machine very much, is the MOXIE experiment currently flying on Perseverance when you're driving around. Uh, that thing has produced, I think, about half a liter of oxygen so far, right? last time they updated it. So, you know, making oxygen is a thing you can do with the air on Mars. Now we know it can be done, you know, in an actual live setting. So that's something you can consider as you're talking about in situ utilization. Uh, the other thing, the only other thing I'm going to say about, um, you know, packing to go to Mars, um, it's not a bad activity called Packing for a Long Trip to Mars. It's been out for about 30 years, done by a group called Mars Quest. Um, I think they operate out of the Arizona State. Anyway, um, they, they have this activity where you've got to figure out what are you going to take to Mars with? Remembering, basically, that every gallon of water equals a gallon of fuel, okay? When you start adding fuel, at some point, your fuselage gets too tight. You're going to add fuselage. Fuselage is made out of metal, last time I checked, or at least carbon nanofibers or whatever. You know, that has mass. You know, so you got to add more mass and you got to add more fuel. So you can see where the problem is rising here, especially when you have a very tight. We are in death. Sorry. Okay. Red's bad, blue is good. All right. This is what the floor of this supposedly nice, smooth crater actually looked like to the one of the Mars, uh, one of uh, Perseverance's cameras looking down. 
Uh, basically, red's bad. Red's too bumpy or rocky or whatever, or it's got full of sand dunes. Any of those things, bad. Colored in red. Yellow is kind of, yeah, you'll probably make it okay. And blue is, yeah, laying there. So basically, um, when you go to your dentist and they have like this two row parking lot, okay, they put uh, Perseverance, put Perseverance down in the space of a small parking lot, okay, surrounded by trees, okay, or ditches or whatever, you know. Well, imagine whatever the red's for you. Go ahead. Um, blue is good. And that's where Curiosity put herself. Um, you can see in the upper left hand corner, then the, the ridges of the delta. There's a lot more rough terrain out there than it looked like when you were just looking at that high rise image a few uh, pictures ago. So the opportunity to send a mission to Mars includes a little thing that Dave Scott talked about. Dave Scott is the commander of the Apollo 15 mission, and he was asked to join the landing site selection committee meeting in NASA in Houston back in 1970. Now, this is from an HBO series called From the Earth. So I've got my essay written, and I've been working on it for about a week. That's not so now I'm going to show sorry. you how I use Grammarly. To edit. Okay, so here's my essay, and I'm going to click through Grammarly suggestions on the right panel. Our blocking. There we go. Tell them it's getting late. <laughs> He'll have this decision to make. Can you guys see the video? Okay? Mary Hills or Hadley Real? Yes, we can. Okay, Mr. Commander, you haven't said a word all day. What do you think? Well, let's see. Uh, no offense, Chet. We feel pretty confident we can land at either side. Dr. Pemberton, I'm one who respects hedging bets. But from what I've learned in the field, Hadley Apennine, with its complex variety of features, both impact and volcanic, is the best choice for putting together a picture of how the moon came to be. Maybe a little riskier, not a little, but also. Also, the Apennines have something else. Grandeur. And I believe there's something to be said for exploring beautiful places. It's good for the spirit. Hadley Appen. That's one of my favorite episodes of that particular program because um, um, he finishes it, of course, the theme Galileo was right. It's a very famous experiment that Galileo thought about. And he said, um, okay, I'm not seeing this. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble seeing my screen. I'm not sure what to do about that. Let me reduce the size. Let me try and get that worked out. <clears throat> this is the problem with working with somebody else's machine. All right. Now, I'm very sorry about this, you guys. Okay. Thank you. We want to go here. There. All right. Meanwhile, back to branch. Okay. Screen again. How are you guys seeing my my uh, PowerPoint again? Yes, we see the uh, Google's presentation. Yep. Excellent. Okay. Ah. So, as you, one of the things I'm hoping to be able to do is to be able to judge what you all do, what you guys and gals do, um, in this in this challenge. I'm very excited to see how you make this work and you know what you come up with and i'm so very curious so i um, hope my curiosity is satisfied um, these are the rules so 
Um, I wanted to point out, especially the bottom part here that I've highlighted and italicized. All of you who contribute, win, lose, or draw, are going to get a certificate attesting that you have participated in this activity. And it will probably look very nice on a college application. Uh, it will also look nice if you're wanting to intern at JPL next summer as a high school student or as a college student uh, to say, hey, I was working with the Mars Society and we talked about landing missions on Mars and here's what we came up with. That's going to carry you a little ways down the road there towards NASA. You know, uh, there are wonderful other opportunities in the private sector as well, obviously, in exploration or in aerospace. You know, but, uh, all of them are going to consider this a feather in their cap, and it's a good thing, okay, from 20th century speak. Okay, so at this point, um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and ask what questions you all have. Let's see, we had a couple come in um, about, I, and thank you, Ken, for mentioning the program uh, rules there, that last slide. Um, yes, we are going to give everyone a handout that has kind of everything broken down in terms of the mission design constraints and what you get, and what you need to avoid. Um, we're still working on that handout, but you can also reference the original program announcement, which Ken just showed some of the text from, um, has a lot of details about uh, what we're doing here. Um, one question was, will we be tasked with designing the landing procedure for our mission as well? Or do we just assume it's already planned similar to return spacecraft? So because we're talking about a 30 metric ton, possibly that much lander, although you could make a smaller, you could break it up and have multiple landings to add up to 30. That's an, an option for you as well. Um, the problem is like, you know, even if it was five metric tons or 10 metric tons, that's way bigger than any other payload that has yet been sent. This yeah. payload were the rover, the two rovers, Curiosity and Perseverance, and they were around one, one metric. Go ahead, Ken. Did you want to add anything to that? Say it's five X, yeah, five X. Yeah, and then you're breaking them up into six. Right. So you are you are going to need sort of by definition to design the landing procedure. It's called an in the in, in the field they call it EDL, entry, descent, and landing, and the um, perseverance and curiosities EDL procedures and, and hardware were made specific to landing that those two rovers. They used the sky crane um, and they also had the back shell and the parachute. And there were also some retro rockets involved as well. So all those things, the parachute, the retro rockets, um, the sky crane all ser served to slow down the rover when it was on its final approach, which you saw in the video that Ken played. And then it sort of dropped, the sky crane dropped off the rover on the ground, all six wheels on the ground. Um, that doesn't have to be how you land your mission. Um, you know, there, there are many other options out there, but that's what NASA chose to do for the rover. If you make them small enough, you can use airbags. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Some, some of the earlier rovers that NASA had developed, like the Pathfinder mission in 96 and 97, and then the two Mars exploration rovers in 2003, those used a system, they were smaller rovers, and they used a system where it was basically you inflate airbags around the spacecraft. And as it's land, as it's, you know, there, it doesn't have a retro rocket, it doesn't slow down, it basically hits the Mars surface and bounces and i think pathfinder bounced 16 times and the uh 2003 rovers it was similar to that mm -hmm. so that was the system that was the system that worked three out of three worked so go ahead ken i was just saying they had a brief retro firing right at the very end to slow it down to a net zero so it was basically a dead drop from like 40 or 50 feet up um, yeah that's right, got, that's right. Um, yeah. but yeah this is um yeah, you, well, that's why I'm here talking about landing site selection <laughs> in the first yeah. place. You have to understand why are these people talking about what they're talking about? If you're going to look for life, 
then obviously Dr. Benner's lecture is what you want to go back and look at again and again. again. It's really fantastic. That was really nice. I'm glad I got to see that one. Thank you, Dr. Brenner. I appreciate that one. It was good. Especially, again, Gil Levin, you know, I, I was one of those saying, you know what? That could have been a good, a good shot, a good experiment. Because the same he got, did he get the same results of both rovers or both landers? I thought he got the same circadian uh, pattern in both. But I, it could have just been like- Yes, he did. There's the same in both. Good, thank you. Because yeah, I, and that was that was to me that was kind of like the icing. You know, uh, you have two two samples that are working this way. Then you start to doubt whatever's refuting those. <laughs> you know, like you said, the chroma chroma chromatop the chromatography. Sorry, chemistry words hard to say. <laughs> Got a couple more questions here. Um, I do it. So Nathan is asking, will it be allowed to incorporate orbital aspects into the mission as well? For example, having a satellite of some sort hitch a ride and get deployed while in orbit. Yeah, absolutely. You could, you could have other hardware that you're dropping off to bolster the science return or do anything else you need. Absolutely. Like can maybe have a communications relay satellite that you drop off as part of the mission. Um, that's absolutely allowed. And then, um, or links, you know, whatever they could have, um, uh, right communication at all times. Um, a CN, my, I love your question. Kind of what you want to do is exactly what you do with perseverance. They landed about a mile and a half away from the cool stuff, the Delta, right? And then they drove over to it, um, you know, checking stuff out on the way, as you usually do when you're driving around Mars. Um, so yeah, you want to land near the rough site and be able to get to it and maybe deploy a secondary machine or something. I really liked about 20 years ago, NC State had these things called nanobots, these little balls basically with some sensors on them, and you just randomly drop them from a, a lander on the way down. And of course, they seek the lowest level because you know they're going to respond to gravity. They're going to fall in all the nooks and crannies and crevices. The ones that will be able to communicate still um, could tell you some interesting things about what's in a crevice on Mars or what's at the bottom of a lava tube, for example, if you wanted to go, go to one of those sites. And you know, one other thing I got I gotta emphasize, there are more, there's more than one way to skin the radiation cat. Okay, you got a problem on Mars. The Maven mission has shown that there's a bunch of micromagnetic fields. You might want to consider looking at that data and landing in one of those minor umbrellas. Not going to help you much, but it will defray some of the uh, UV. Um, the other thing is, of course, what do you do with uh, human waste? You know, why not pack it into the inner out, this spacing between the inner and outer shell of your habitat, right? Um, then you've got a radi partial radiation shield. Yeah, augment that with a foot or two of dirt, you know, or some strategically placed rocks or flat rocks on top of the earth's habitat. I don't know. There's lots of ways to think about the radiation problem, but it doesn't have to be a killer. I'm gonna I'm gonna guess that it's going to be something your judges are gonna look for. Did they answer that question? Because if you have people spend three years on Mars, I you better do something about the radiation. The sunscreen ain't gonna do it. <laughs> okay. Uh, put my SDF 50 on, I'm good, right? No. Um, it's more than just UV. Anyway, um, any other questions about anything? And oh, I'm sorry, James, do I have like two minutes to talk about the solar system ambassador program? Yeah, absolutely. Let me just, before you do that, let me just for the recording okay. ask that last question. Um, you did answer it, but I just want to get the question on the record here. It, sure. The question was from CN. And it's, it is, is it possible to choose rougher landing sites if they're more scientifically valuable or should we go with a smoother landing site because it's easier? And as Ken mentioned, you, you know, it's up to you. And there are, there are reasons to choose a, um, a rougher landing site. And that's what some of the rovers have done. They've landed close to it, but not exactly on it to, because it was scientifically a target to go visit. Okay, the JPL Solar System Ambassadors Program it's a volunteer program. Uh, you can opt in and out at any time. And you have to hold six events 
during the year where you're explaining some aspect of exploration to audiences. It can be over the internet, it can be in your school library, it can be pretty much anywhere. Uh, they send you free materials to hand out along with the um, presentation. What I like to call, as they say in New Orleans, uh, lanyard, right? Everybody leaves is a little something, okay? You know, a sticker or a handbook, you know, a bookmark, something that says, hey, yeah, I saw this thing about Mars and I got the sticker to prove it, you know? Um, so your job is basically to pique interest in NASA's missions of exploration and anybody else's mission of exploration you want to talk about. Okay, they're not restrictive. They're not NASA only. They obviously have a bent. Since they are a NASA program, <laughs> they kind of will expect you to say something nice about them once in a while. Okay, so if you're a NASA here, you probably don't want to do uh, the sources of NASA thing. There are other so ambassador programs you can get into, like the Mars Society one. Which, yeah, um, I was I was just about to say we we have an ambassador program now too on the Mars Society ambassador program. You can find out about that on our website, marssociety.org. So does this lecture kind of kind of help me become a Mars Society ambassador? <laughs> it doesn't hurt. It don't hurt. Okay. Um, all right. Anybody have any other questions? Um, okay, then I got a question for you. Why are you doing this? I like it. I love it. But you want to be able to answer that question. Here's what you want to be able to do. When you're in an elevator riding up with somebody and they happen to be saying you're a science teacher from high school and you want to explain to them what you're doing, you ought to be able to explain it on floors one through six without stops. Okay? So you got to have like a 20 second spin. What am I doing this summer? Well, here's what I did. We built a habitat people can live in on Mars. Uh, it's not bad. What'd you do? Uh, World of Warcraft. Good. <laughs> so whatever, you know, whatever the other people are doing, that's cool. But you guys are doing something cool. And gals, excuse me. Uh, I use guys in the 60s way we use guys. I'm sorry. Guys and gals. And everybody who's with no. um, So James, am I, am I booked? We'll come over there done. No, this was fantastic, Ken. Um, yeah, I think we can kind of wrap it up unless there's any more questions. Um, I will, so a couple housekeeping items for the students. So tomorrow we have a lecture. Um, it's Dr. Chris McKay. It's definitely one you want to try to attend. This is one of the really critical lectures for the course tomorrow, Chris McKay. Um, but also we're going to talk about forming teams as well tomorrow at the second half of that, of that call. So, um, you know, two reasons why you should try to be on that call tomorrow. Um, if you're not able to attend, that's okay. Um, but just so you know, we are going to start pairing people up into teams starting tomorrow, and we'll continue that into the weekend, um, probably over email. Um, and I, I'm, I may set up the Discord for us. Um, let me just kind of take a quick poll of, of folks here. Um, are you guys familiar with Discord? I'm assuming everyone is because it's used a lot with like video games and stuff. But um, is that a tool that you would be okay with using Discord? We also could use Slack, which is very similar. Um, and I use pretty, I use Slack pretty regularly with the Mars Society with other stuff. Um, okay, everyone's saying absolutely this uh, Discord's fine. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, cool. So we'll do that then. Yeah, I think it is it is better in some ways. Um, although for me, it's kind of overwhelming all the different stuff that comes up because I'm on a bunch of different discords. So but that's my own personal problem. All right, so that sounds good. We will use and I'll set that up and I will invite everyone and we can start uh, using that for the team uh, team collaboration starting tomorrow. So, all right, well, thanks everyone. Thank you, Ken, and thank you, Dr. Benner. Um, Hi, everybody. Yeah, we really appreciate you guys spending some of your day with us. And uh, I'll see everyone tomorrow. Have a great night.